Good morning. Thank you for joining me for another five good minutes with the Word. I'm Barry Bryson, and we're in uh, Mark chapter 14. Jesus has prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's uh, willingly, voluntarily, and uh, with a prepared mind um, walking out of the Garden uh, to meet um, uh, his uh, persecutors, those who will arrest him, and to meet his betrayer. So we're in Mark chapter 14 verses 43 through 52. So let's read those verses right now. Now, he who was betraying him, excuse me, verse 43, immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up, accompanied by a multitude with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now, he who was betraying him had given them a signal saying, whomever I shall kiss, He's the one, seize him, and lead him away under guard. And after coming, he immediately went up to him, saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. And a certain one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a robber? Every day I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but this happened that the scriptures might be fulfilled, and they all left him and fled. And a certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body, and they seized him. But he left the linen sheet behind and escaped naked. There's so much here. We know why it's necessary for Judas to identify Jesus. It's dark in the first place, and we who live in, in modern times with electricity do not understand what darkness used to be, even, even with the moon out, what darkness used to be. So it's dark. Uh, they need Jesus. They want Jesus. They don't want to grab the wrong Galilean, um, and so they need somebody to identify the right guy. Uh, and, and to identify him at a place and at a time when they can take him without the crowd getting involved. And that's what Judas provides. Um, um, so uh, he comes up to Jesus, calls him rabbi, and kisses him. This would also have been just as chilling, even more so for a first century audience as it is for us. Men in, in, in American and, and, and British um, Anglo-Saxon uh, culture, um, we don't kiss each other. We just don't. Um, I haven't kissed one of my nephews since they were like 15 or 16, and that was only on a lark. So anyway, we don't kiss each other. Kissed my grandpa until the day he died, but um, but uh, we just don't. But but they did, and kissing was quite ritualized. The the lesser person kissed the greater person, um, and and. Um, and, but in Christianity, we kiss each other, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, because we're all equal. So he comes up to Jesus, shows him respect, calls him rabbi, gives him a kiss, and in that way betrays him. It's, it's, it's a terrible, it's a shocking betrayal. And um, there are people there with swords and clubs, and come, they come from the, the hierarchy. The temple had its own security force. They did, trained security force. And that is evidently who has come out to arrest Jesus, this trained security force. Um, and they, they come to arrest Jesus. Um, a certain one of the apostles draws his sword and cuts off a, a guy's ear, a servant's ear. Well, if Peter is the source, Peter makes sure he tells this part, but he doesn't identify himself as the one who did it, which John does. Um, John names names at the end of the first century. He tells us who said what and who did what whenever it's just a certain person in the other Gospels. Peter uh, is named and the servant is named and his name is Malchus. And John also tells us that Jesus heals Malchus's ear. And Jesus says, don't do this. Why did you draw your sword? If you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. It would have been very easy for this to have quickly devolved into a slaughter of Jesus' apostles, which Jesus did not want to happen. And even in Mark's gospel, we read one of the ways that Jesus diffused the situation by handing himself over. This is God's will. This is part of the plan. This is what's supposed to happen. And he hands himself over. 
I want us to notice a couple of things. One is that Jesus speaks up. Now, Jesus is going to be silent for the most part. He's not going to say a word to Herod. He's not going to say many words to uh, Caiaphas. He's not going to say many words to, um, to Pilate. So he's generally silent. But there are times when he speaks up and says the truth. Uh, and this is one of those times. So whenever we read in Isaiah 53 that he doesn't open his mouth, well, he does open his mouth a couple of times. But we know exactly what Isaiah means. I mean, he doesn't open his mouth to defend himself. He opens his mouth to speak truth to the people who need to see truth. And he says, yeah, you're, you could have arrested me at any time, but you didn't. So think about that. And, and, and when a guy strikes him, uh, when he says something um, in the presence of the high priest in John 18, he says, what did I say that was wrong? And if I didn't say anything wrong, why did you hit me? That's the definition of turning the other cheek, isn't it? It's not backing down and not hitting back, which is what Jesus demonstrates um, throughout this event. Um, one other thing. I think we have the signature of Mark right here. Um, in the same way that, um, that um, Alfred Hitchcock always made a cameo, I think Mark makes a cameo appearance in his gospel to let us know he's the one writing this down. What do we know about Mark? He's from Jerusalem. Uh, he's well. He's from, he's from a well-off family. Um, he's from a priestly family. So he, he would have been a very young man at the time this was happening um, and would have known about the events that were going on. He, he's, he is, the, um, he is the, um, uh, the, the nephew of Barnabas. And uh, so Barnabas, of course, is, um, is an early uh, convert and an important early convert and leader in the church. So we, we would not be surprised that he would be interested in Jesus at this time. Um, and so he's out following. He sees he himself as an eyewitness, in other words, to these events. If this isn't Mark, why is this here? I mean, it's not here for any other reason. No other reason to mention there would be a young man there. Um, there's a cool way that it connects with Joseph, doesn't it? Joseph with Potiphar's wife, just because we have, again, you know, somebody running off and with someone else holding their clothing, um, a young man fleeing the scene. Um, um, but I, I do think that it serves the purpose of being a signature uh, of Mark as the author of this gospel. Okay, um, we're going to pick up with verse 53 next time. Thank you for joining me for another five good minutes with the word.